since her childhood, music has played a huge role in Anna Vidovi's life. Croatian guitar princess, as many like to call her, started playing guitar at the age of five, thanks to her brother Victor. She performed on stage for the very first time when she was eight, as a guest at her brother's concert in their hometown, Karlovac. From the very early age, everyone was in awe of her remarkable talent, hence why her international career started when she was only 11. Two years later, Anna became the youngest student ever enrolled at the Academy of Music in Zagreb. Her music career soon skyrocketed, and she continued her education in the United States, where she graduated at the Peabody Conservatory. This wonder kid from a small Croatian town Karlovac has become one of the youngest virtuosa in the classical guitar field. She has performed all over Australia, Brazil, Israel, Japan, Korea, Mexico and the United States and won various different prestigious competitions. Even though she lives in the States now, Croatian guitar enthusiasts had a chance to enjoy her performance at the Zagreb Guitar Festival back in 2017. And this is how other guitarists see Anna and her work. Hello, it's Matt Hensley here with Austin Classical Guitar. Oh my, where to begin when thinking about Anna Vidovic? Um, I could talk about her extraordinary artistry, her amazing work ethic, uh, the professionalism that just delivers some of the most mesmerizing concerts year after year after year. In our 20 years working together, it has been such a joy to know her. And I'm gonna go with the very first word that popped into my mind when I started thinking about Anna, and that word is kindness. Um, Anna brings a kindness and consideration with her everywhere she goes, if it's teaching, if it's on the radio or television, or if it's on the concert stage. Um, so uh, grateful to know her and uh, look forward to every time we get to collaborate and make magic together. So here's to Anna Vidovic. I met Anna in 1999 in Alessandria. Uh, we were both taking part in the Pitaluga competition and there was uh, this one thing there that I'll always remember. Um, we were both going to play in the finals and uh, the obligatory piece was Concerto de Aranjuez, which uh, at that point was still very fresh for me, so I actually didn't manage by that point yet to learn uh, a part in the third movement. There were some chords that I still didn't know how it goes, <laughs> so I kind of also in the rehearsal, um, well, I kind of faked it a bit, but I didn't really know what notes those are. So what happened was that uh, backstage, before uh, the finals, I was just kind of trying to fake this and I, and I just told Anna, well, I, I don't know these chords. And uh, <laughs> her first reaction was, I mean, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, you're, <laughs> you're playing it right now. And, um, but then, without thinking twice, she just took her guitar and uh, she played it a couple of times. She showed me <laughs> those chords. And uh, she played it a couple of times until I could do it, and uh, that was it. And because of that, I could, I was able then to do it. So at, at that point, you know, it, uh, I, I didn't really think about it a lot. But then, now thinking back, um, it's quite something. I mean, I don't think there are many people that uh, would do such a thing. You know, helping a fellow competitor. Uh, at, at that stage uh, just before you were going to go on the stage and, and play so um, this is something why I will always have a very nice first memory of Anna. It's so nice. 
I got, well, I got so emotional here. It's so nice to, to see my friends, you know, um, and Goran especially, and uh, Matt, and, and uh, so many memories with them, you know, so thank you for doing that. Well, it is our pleasure. Uh, so welcome everyone to this uh, Music Delights Q&A with uh, Anna Vidovic. Um, many of us know her, uh, all of us respect and adore her, and this is a great opportunity for us to, um, well, ask her a few questions. Uh, thank you for being here with us. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, thank um, you. It's, it's a pleasure. We heard that you had quite a rumble and tumble coming back to Croatia from uh, the United States where you live. Is that correct? Yes, the, I had a, a, a little bit of um, uh, issue coming here, but, and it's it's very uh, it's very difficult and emotional for me always because I look forward to coming home and you know seeing my family and my my brother and um, I have a I have a new niece, so I was really looking forward to seeing her, uh, and she's three months old right now, so it's it's a really important time to see her and spend time with her. And some flights were canceled, but and then they were rearranged, and they put me on another flight. So I'm finally home. Well, we're so happy that that you are, um, and uh, congratulations, uh, three months yeah. uh, old niece. That's uh, uh, that's nothing, nothing uh, too small. I'm uh, we're glad that you made it. Uh, so you mentioned home, which is a beautiful way uh, to segue into my first question. Which is well, you came from a you come from a small town, Karlovac, mm -hmm. uh, and then you well you went from Karlovac into the wide wide world. So uh, we briefly heard in the insert, the video insert, as to how this journey started. But it would be, I think, for all of us, very interesting to hear your own perspective, uh, what it means uh, for you to you know have come from a small little town and uh, head into the big world? Well, it was quite a journey. I mean, I, you know, uh, Karlovitz is a, is, a, is a very small town and um, I grew up here uh, in a very, um, you know, peaceful uh, uh, part of town in, in the country and uh, surrounded with a lot of nature and it's just, um, it was a beautiful, you know, beautiful time. So I, when I was um, deciding where to go, I was always interested in the United States. I don't know why I always w wanted to uh, go there and maybe, um, um, you know, pursue my studies and, and so on. But uh, it was it was it was quite a shock because I wasn't um, I was you know I wasn't uh, away from my family for too long. So this was the first time where I actually, you know, went abroad and, and uh, would be away from, from my parents for, for a long period of time. So it was, uh, it took some adjustment and, and I was, it was, it was a very stressful time for me because as, as you know, when we leave, when we leave home, you don't know what to expect, you don't know, you don't, you don't know anything. So, um, but slowly... You know, you, you adjust to a way of life in the States and and um, I'm glad now that I did it, but it was it was a long, long journey and, and it took a lot of adjusting and, and, you know, the culture, the language, the people. I basically didn't know anyone except my, my teacher. So, um, as I said, it was a very, it was a very long, long journey, as you know, you know, so, but it's something that we all go through because we all move and. Um, but you know now when I come home it's it's always it's always a nice you know experience I love coming home and I love coming back it feels like I never left so mm -hmm. um, I totally feel you on that regard I think um, getting to know the other side of uh, way of living you know America is so big mm -hmm. um, that that somehow influences the way we perceive the smaller societies uh, where we come from. So I'm sure, uh, as it's the case with me when I go back to Ljubljana, and uh, maybe when you go back to Karlovac, is uh, you appreciate uh, the people and the culture even more so. 
Um, yes, you appreciate a lot more everything, um, all you know the, the the people, the culture, and because you're away for so long, so mm. you, you learn how to reappreciate it again, which is a, which is a nice feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I must say I'm uh, rather jealous that you made it to Croatia this summer around. I'll have to unfortunately wait it out a little bit longer. Uh, hopefully, the pandemic passes as quick as possible so that things go back to normal. But, I, hope so. uh, I, hope so. I hope you can go soon. Yes. Well, I don't, uh, for sure it'll work out somehow. Um, the insert that we saw mentioned your brother Victor and I remember a few years back, I think it was maybe three years ago at the Zagreb Guitar Festival, you held a concert at the Croatian National Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, and back when it was still in one piece now after the big earthquake it's uh, quite shattered and you shared the stage with your brother for a few pieces and that was fantastic um you know uh, i guess from a personal standpoint and i'm sure everyone would like to know what uh, what does it mean to you to have had an older influence uh you know in classical guitar and as as uh, as far as I heard, Victor was incredible as as a young performer too. And so you know, I'm, uh, we're all curious, probably, um, how did that rivalry or friendship, you know, sibling friendship, how did that work out in terms of the guitar, classical guitar upbringing? Well, Victor, Victor was actually the reason why I started playing guitar mm -hmm. um, because he was a big influence, and and uh, he is the um, Yes, he. I mean, he was my idol. You know, he started very young, and and I just fell in love with the sound of the guitar because I was. We're about seven years apart, so mm -hmm. he. You know, so I was a baby basically when he started uh, playing and practicing. And um, I mean, he was amazing. You know, he was preparing for competitions. He uh, um, went abroad very young, and you know, won the competition in Geneva. And when he was fourteen, I think very, very, very young. So. So I um, grew up, you know, watching him and listening to his practicing, and and so I um, he was actually the first teacher. He he taught me, you know, the basics of the guitar, the the hand position, you know, the the some technical uh, issues, and so I I kind of studied with him for about a year before I I, I went to the music school and studied with uh, Istvan Istvan Remmer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Victor was the reason. I mean, I, I don't think I would have probably picked up the guitar if it was not for him. Um, and uh, but we, you know, we, it's um, it's interesting because my father also played guitar, but electric guitar. Oh, sure. I, I think he was in love with classical guitar, but never played it. So it was, um, um, you know, the, I think the love for music pr probably came from my father. Uh, you mm -hmm. know. Then later on, we all. I have another brother who's a pianist as well. So mm -hmm. we're all That's beautiful that you uh, had this love for music instilled from very young age. Um, just curious, uh, you know, usually siblings are competitive. Did you practice side by side? Did you push each other's metronome? You know, up, up, up. You know, I can play this. You can play this. Not so much. Not so much. No, okay. I don't think. No, we. I mean, we were kids. We were, you know, joking. Sure in other ways but I don't think we were I never felt that really mm -hmm. I, mean, I never really um, felt that but you know then Victor left home very early and mm -hmm. so we, we kind of grew up we, we were growing we didn't see we, we didn't see each other much you know Victor mm -hmm. and I because he went to study and mm -hmm. he was away so uh, we kind of each each of us developed our own you know voice and our own, own way of playing and and we were always very, um, you know, we knew that we, we had to develop our own, you know, individuality. So we, we were, mm. but I, I never felt that. No, no, mm. not really. So. Well, uh, it's, uh, it was certainly a delight to uh, uh, see you perform together uh, on the stage three years ago. And, um, you know, and. Uh, moments because we never, you know, we, we don't get a chance to do that. So it was a absolutely. really nice moment. I, I love that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that uh, essentially after about a year of uh, well s uh, learning from Victor, you uh, you went to study with Istvan. Was that uh, at the academy or was that b before uh, the academy? 
this that was before the academy um i studied with him uh privately sort of yeah because he was victor's teacher so um okay. so victor spoke with him and said you know he has he had a sister and um you know he asked ishwan if it would be possible for ishwan to to work with me as well so ishwan said yes and that's how we started mm. basically worked with him for about you know 10 years um it's transitioned into the academy, correct? Yes. yes. So before, because I went to the academy, I think in 1994, 93. So I was, I was about, I don't know, 13 or 14. But I worked with Ishman from, from about 8 to 18. So, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years, 10 years of, of studying with him. And how was it, um, well, entering the academy, the university, University, uh, you know, environment at such a young age uh, must be a special experience. You know, uh, maybe one grows up a little quicker or something. Um, what was it like for you? Yeah, I think I, I think I grew up very quickly. Yeah, I think it was um, it was because I was surrounded with adults. You know, and I was very young, and so it was. I had I had to grow up very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really have, you know, the, the regular experience that, you know, in going the regular, uh, not the regular way, but you know what I mean, just going to school and then going to the academy later. I just, it just, everything happened so quickly. So I had to, I had to adjust, you know, to a lot of things and, and, um, and so, but, uh, yeah, and I didn't have, you know, I didn't have time to go to the regular school. So... <laughs> Because I was practicing so much and going to the academy, so I think I would just go to school several times a week or something. Yeah, everything was a little with me. Everything was a little, you know, too, too fast. I think so. Um, but that's the way it was, you know. It's, it's the way it was, and um, but I think later on, when I when I came to the states, I um, kind of readjusted everything, and because I was surrounded. With yeah, I mean, I was surrounded with people of my age, and so it was, it was different. But in soccer, it was it was you know it was um, it was difficult, but um, I enjoyed working with Ishwan. I mean, that was you know the Ishwan was always always he was a great teacher. I mean, I was you know so lucky to be able to study with him. So um, and to have that consistency of you know working with him and and just he basically you know taught me everything I knew. So um, yeah, he was a great teacher. I, I think many of us guitarists coming from that environment have had some early career um, uh, experience learning from Istvan. I also remember when he was going to a music school in Velenia, in mm -hmm. Slovenia, and uh, my dad would drive me to get master classes from him. And I remember one distinct thing really well, and that is how adamant he was about a guitarist having to tune the guitar properly before starting to play. Yeah. And I, I will never forget this. And it's, you know, it's such a delicate instrument that goes out of tune so quick. So, so this is something that I really sort of am happy about that I heard it. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how old I was, but uh, it was pretty early on, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, he was very de also very detail oriented, you know. Very like, paid attention to a lot of details. So, but that that was yeah. That's definitely one of the things we we all have to remember from time to time to have to tune our guitar, you know, properly. Absolutely. Um, so I I understand that um, your international career, you know, performing, and, uh, competing, uh, sort of went side by side pretty early on, um, right? It. Uh, as you were at the academy, you you started sort of going out performing and so forth, um, and that's pretty early on, I would say. I mean, age of thirteen, maybe or fourteen, maybe even earlier than that. Um, what you know, what experience do you draw from that? Um, namely, do you think that it is it affected you positively, having the chance to perform so early on and uh, having this experience, you know, uh, with uh, that some of us get much later on in our lives. Um, looking back, are you happy about that? 
Um, yeah, I think I yes, I'm I'm happy about the experience. I'm ha also happy. Um, well, it's uh, there, there. There's always you know, it kind of it kind of goes both ways. There's good things and there's you know not so not so good things. So I think it's it's um, it is good not to start performing too early. I think that's um, a little bit tricky. So and not too much. You you kind of have to be careful. Um, but competitions are good. You know, I started with uh, the competitions about when I was thirteen or fourteen. I um, Ishtun was you know suggesting that, and it was good because I was also surrounded with you know kids of my age, and and um, so I was um, able to. Competitions are good in many ways, mm -hmm. you know, but um, you kind of, um, I don't know, you, it's, um, I think it's a, it's a good way of, you know, finding your place in the, in the guitar music world and, and um, as long as you, again, don't take it personally if you don't win or if you don't get the prize that you, that you um, wanted or, or, you know, but, um, it's just it also teaches you how to perform in front of people in front of judges and mm -hmm. so um, that's a good experience. Um, but um, as far as performing, I think I think my first my first live performance was about it was actually Victor's concert. Mm -hmm. and so he invited me to play as a guest. So I was about eight. I think that the that um, uh, th that uh, a little clip that you showed in the yes. beginning of the video that, that that was actually the first the first performance so um, so I think if you start um, performing in you know in an early age I think you you um, learn how to you know be more relaxed in front of the audience and and uh, so but again perhaps not too early I wouldn't suggest to start you know to start performing too too early I think there there's there's certain lessons that we have to learn, and there's a certain time frame that we have to um, you know consider, because yeah, sorry you, you were going to say something. Well, I uh, the question uh, that I uh, that I asked was there because I talked many times to be it friends or acquaintances who've you know been deemed wunderkinds and you know started performing at the age of five six you know very early on and then by the age of 20 they were uh, really just fed up with everything you know uh, and this is really why I asked and uh, of course everyone has a I'm sure a personal experience you know uh, and it's just I was just kind of curious now to switch it up a bit um, I really want to ask um, you know, given that uh, you're a one of the favorites at the Zagreb Guitar Festival, and that Zagreb Guitar Festival uh, is the founding partner of a platform network called Eurostrings, and uh, you have been involved in in I understand a few occasions uh, via this network, and um, I'm curious what you think about this. Uh, you know, we're quite proud that this started a few years ago as the first ever European network of guitar festivals with an idea to create a better tomorrow for the uh, classical guitar sector all around and uh, we work with you know young um, young superstars you know uh, who will likely have great careers tomorrow uh, you know and I know you coach some of them and uh, I'm just really flat out curious what uh, what experience you've had with this and how you look at the whole platform and and also uh, you know your thoughts on the work with these individuals called the Eurostring artists who are essentially you know fabulous fabulous young players uh, uh, you know grasping the next big career. I think I think it's great. I think I think you know you you and I talked a little bit about that and. and I think you know how important it is to create one place where where they, they all can you know learn and and connect and and I think it, it's just it's just great because because it's difficult I think it's difficult for them you know to, to kind of find their own place and and uh, it's I think it's getting you know more and more difficult for the classical guitarists because there there's the the level is very very high and 
you know, there there there's some really really talented people out there. So it, they need support. You know, they, they need a lot of support at this point. Um, they're young and 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 you know they need they need to be taken care of. So I think I think it's great that you guys are doing this, and I'm you know I'm so proud that that it's happening here. So. I think it's a great, a great initiative, you know, and and uh, and like I said, the level is very, very high, you know. It's it's um, and it's getting even even more, you know, mm -hmm. even more higher. So um, so I'm I'm very, very, very happy about that. Well, we're uh, we're happy to hear that. Um, we've been talk talking now for uh, a little while. I uh, propose that we check out some uh, other little video insert um, and. This is a video that I found on YouTube, and it is a video of a very popular piece called The Recuerdos de la Alhambra.
Okay, so that's uh, one of the most famous pieces by Francisco Tarraga. Even those who don't know the title of it uh, certainly have probably heard it somewhere. Uh, that was one of the most beautiful renditions that I've uh, that I've heard around. So congratulations on the performance. Um, I pulled this uh, from YouTube. Uh, thank you to Sika's Guitars for making the video. Um, uh, and uh, this video, I think, has something like I'm just ballparking because I don't remember, but maybe like six million views. And uh, I, in addition to this, I once before Googled um, most sought after uh, classical guitars or guitars in general on YouTube, and your name comes really high up there. Uh, so you're incredibly uh, popular on YouTube. And I'm curious, I mean, has that had an influence on your career at all? Do people reach out, you know, have you had more opportunities because you've cultivated such a presence on this uh, video platform? Yeah, I think, I think YouTube has been very, very helpful. Um, I think uh, uh, since it started, um, I think the first video that was uploaded was about like 10 years ago. And I, I really, I really noticed the difference, you know, and, and people reaching out and, and, I thank thanks to uh, YouTube for sure because because um, you know so many people watch uh, the video just it's YouTube is just so incredible mm -hmm. and um, I think I think it's just a great way of um, you know presenting your work and and uh, you know so it's it's just I think it's, it's been very very helpful for me you know career wise mm -hmm. uh, and. So there's, you know, many people, uh, many guitarists out there, musicians that are trying to create content for uh, YouTube. Well, not just for YouTube, for really any social media platform. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed perhaps most, uh, your most recent well done videos are in general uh, made by Sika's guitars. Do you collaborate with them often? Do you sometimes do videos on your own or or uh, do you sort of trust them with the video production? I mean, they do it very well. Yeah, they, they, they do it very well. I've, I've worked yeah. with them for several for several years, and they've recorded some of the, you know, live performances that I've did, that done in Germany. Um, so recently, um, we've done a, um, a recording in their studio, actually. So this is the first time we did it in their studio, which was a great experience. So I love working with them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they're professional and their sound is, is wonderful and also the visual aspect as well. So they really are very, very careful and, 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 and um, you know, take care of all the details and because they, 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 know, they know guitar and they, they know how difficult it is to actually record it. So you mm -hmm. have, to be, um, have to be very careful with the sound and, and um, so they, they do a really, really nice job. And plus, I, I like working with them, and, and they're, you know, they're wonderful people. So, um, you know, the presentation is very important, you know, how you present yourself. And, and um, uh, it, it's, it's so, you know, but I rarely record on my own. Uh, you know, so I, I, I would rather leave that to someone that knows, you know, how to record, because I just, you know, I don't have, you know, such a professional equipment, and so... I would rather work with someone that you know actually does that. You know, does a good job. So, yeah. well, I think the effort was marvelous. I mean, I I pretty much watched all of the you know as I was trying to pick the right video. I I watched uh, through more or less all of the videos up there, and uh, and I was very happy with the quality of the recordings. Um, so you tour well, not right now. <laughs> But uh, you tour otherwise pretty extensively. It's really what you do um, in your career. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure on, the, on, on the travels, you must have had some anecdotes, uh, funny stories that have happened. I, I find that uh, listeners always enjoy, uh, always enjoy hearing about, about those. Maybe, do you remember one or two cool, cool things? Uh, that you could share? Yeah, things always happen on the road, uh, especially um, uh, getting to an act, you know, traveling and getting to a place that you need to, you need to be. Sometimes there's some, 
not so pleasant things there are sometimes there's pleasant things things usually happen with the you know airlines and traveling sometimes your bags are lost and sometimes your guitar is lost so it's it's um there's always something happens but to to um I would, you know, when when you ask me, sometimes I I I don't. I have to think for for a second, like if there was something that that happened. Some, you know, usually this the like questions about the guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, we always carry a guitar with mm -hmm. us, so sometimes people ask funny questions about that. I find it, but um, I have to say, I don't have any like really, really, really funny stories from the road. Um, I've been lucky not to have any, you know, crazy experiences, um, you know, all, with all these years of of, of traveling. Uh, but uh, do you do you have any crazy stories? Well, uh, yes, absolutely, of course. I mean, and I've had my guitar lost maybe twice or three times. Uh, what do you do when when that happens? Has that happened often to you? A few times, yes. I mean, they they usually deliver it, but. Um, I, usually that happens when I when I'm going home. Like and then you know, one one time my guitar was missing for a week and I thought I thought I thought it was stolen. I thought so, you know it was like it was gone forever. But they actually found it. So mm -hmm. but um, if if you know I think there was one time when I had to borrow a guitar because they lost they, they was it, it, they didn't deliver it. So but usually you know they're pretty good about that. So are you pretty chill when that happens or do you panic? Uh, you know lose all nerves i try to chill yeah I try, because there's nothing you can do you just have to kind of you know if i if i get uh, sad it just doesn't it doesn't help me so i try to stay yeah. i try yeah. to stay calm and, you know but when i when, when the guitar was missing for a week i was i was pretty nervous i thought it was going to be gone forever but mm -hmm. helped, so. well well that's, that's good that's good and you haven't had it smashed by any airline, I, I reckon, too. I had it good. I had smashed not not uh, the guitar, but the case. Okay, okay. The case was smashed completely, but the guitar stayed intact. So I guess, I guess the, the case did a good job of protecting. The case did a great job. Absolutely. Well, fantastic. So, so Anna, we um, extended a um, uh, an opportunity on our socials for questions for from fans so we had uh we had uh, quite a few fans write you know um things that they would like to ask you and i'll sort of randomly pick i have them written here but um there was one question that uh directly relates to uh the performance of the uh tarega piece mm -hmm. Um, and I will ask the question, but then I will also extend the question with my inquiry because I'm, I'm curious about something too. So, of course, the question is, why does Anna play tremolo with M and I fingers, well, actually thumb, middle, uh, index, um, and not AMI as traditional? Now, I will add to this question and say, <clears throat> were you holding fort? down with your ring finger as you were playing on the second string for control's sake so you were you actually touching and then sec and then second thing i noticed that the phrasing that she did had um almost like a momentum of uh, conscientious relaxation so that the hand could maybe restart with another push of speed uh, mm -hmm. was that about was that about the uh, right assumption Yes, you 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 you're right. Uh, that, that was very very uh, you're very perceptive of you. To, you that's, that's that's exactly it. Yes, I mean um, the the eighth finger is um, there for the steadiness and also for the control, but also not to. Sometimes I accidentally um, hit the, the the you know the E string. So so I just put it there so that doesn't happen. Uh, because there's some, some instances where, you know, if you don't put it there, you might accidentally hit the, the E string. Mm -hmm. um, but then it just gives you an extra sense of steadiness and, you know, I, I, it's, because the, the hand would not feel so steady if I didn't do it. But I, I don't do it throughout the whole mm -hmm. time. I just sometimes I release it, just depends on what I'm doing. Uh, but... Um, 
the, the yeah the, the the musical part is that that's i guess that's you know also gives me some sort of i don't know uh, maybe it's easier to interpret it, you know, with, with when the, the finger is placed there. Um, it just gives you a little bit more control. So, but the reason why I do it with PMIM is I've always done it that way. I've always, since I was very young, you know, I just, um, I could never make it work with PAMI. So, um, it, I didn't feel like the, the tremolo was steady and even. So, I just, that's why I do it with only, only you know, only PMIM, mm -hmm. but I, it's not something that, you know, it just depends, like, you know, every hand is different, so it's not something that I would 100%, you know, say you have to do it that way, it doesn't, doesn't have to be that way, it just, um, it just works for me, you know, but, um, yeah, so. No, it's, uh, it's, and so, it works fabulously well, so why not, you know, it's, uh, um, I, um, I don't really remember who told me this, but uh, said once, uh, I think it was actually Bill Kanengeiser when I was studying with him. He said, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, uh, yeah. essentially, if it works, it works. You know, you, uh, you know, why, why, why change it? You know, yeah. uh, so that's great. Um, I have, uh, let me pick uh, another random one. Um, Okay, how long do you practice right hand warm ups a day? Uh, right hand, okay. Mm -hmm. um, right. I usually do scales before I start practicing, so I do about 30 minutes, like to 40 minutes sometimes, depends like how my hands feel. If they're too uh, cold or they're not, I don't feel like they're warmed up enough, I'll do, I do, I'll do like 45 minutes of um, just scales. Mm -hmm. but, you know, very slow and, and um, making sure that I warm up really well. It's, it's good not to start practicing if your hands are not warmed up. So, and scales are extremely important. And sometimes I'll do some etudes, um, like, a, you know, first etudes by Lobos, for example. It's very good for the right hand. Um, and, but very, very slow, that's the key. And, you know, not, not playing it fast. So, um, and then some, like, the third etude is good for the left hand, for example. The third acted by Lobos. So those two are my favorites. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. It's uh, uh, um, a, a two, it's even simple as well. Lobos maybe are not that simple, but uh, something like um, carcasses and uh, solars, and those are always wonderful to, to use either as a warm up routine or just to keep up the technique going. Mm -hmm. And uh, you actually uh, answered. Uh, well, one additional question, which was, do you still study scales? You said yes. Um, I'm curious, uh, uh, major, minor, and or modes? You mean, well, I guess major. Okay. I, I major, yes. Happy day, right? <laughs> yes. Always start with a happy thought, you know. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. <laughs> and um, here's another question, that should be easy. How many hours per day do you practice? It, it really depends. It's never the same. Uh, it varies every day, uh, sometimes more or less. I, I usually practice until I do what I need to do that day. You know, if I have a plan in the morning, I say, okay, I'll work on this piece, and I just do it until I finish everything. Um, so there's no time set. Uh, it's sometimes it's three hours, sometimes it's seven hours, sometimes it's, you know, it just depends. Yeah, yeah. You can still practice seven hours. But with breaks, no, no, not, not, um, well, still pretty amazing, you know, it's, um, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's not, you know, I would actually rather do less, but you know, seven hours is, but if I'm preparing something new, then I, you know, I have, I have time, I need time. So <laughs> yeah, sometimes, but not more than that. You know. I, I guess that segues very well into, uh, well, how did your practice routine change over the development of your career? I, I, I think you sort of said, well, uh, less is more, if it's more focused, maybe? Yeah, it needs to be very focused. Um, so, some, yes, less is more, because you lose concentration more you practice. So, uh, my suggestion would be less, yes, three, four hours, but with very good concentration. You know, <laughs> focus, focus to work. You have to have a plan what you need to do that day. Um, and uh, you don't have to do everything 
you know, the same day. You can do something tomorrow. So um, just, uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I practiced for many, many hours, but I think it was, it was too much because, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of, I was just playing. I wasn't really focused that much. So I would suggest less, less hours. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess this is a, this is an interesting one in the sense of, well, everyone sort of tackles speed differently, but how to work the speed? Well, I guess let me re, uh, rephrase the question a bit. Uh, how do you address speed when playing scales? How do you achieve speed? Um, I mean, you achieve speed by practicing very, very slow. Practice, mm -hmm. practice, you know, scales should not be played uh, fast at all, actually, until you know, until you feel ready that you are that you have um, that you're ready to play it in a tempo. So. Um, for example, I was just practicing the Grand, Grand Sonata, Grand Sonata Royka, and you know, there's a lot of uh, passages there. So I still, I mean, I practice them very, very slow. Um, even though I played this piece for quite a while, I still have to go back and you know redo it. So um, just practice very, very, very slow, and with the metronome, and also with the metronome. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And sometimes you can do um, the dotted rhythms, you know, and, and I, that, that helps me a lot because it teaches me the independence of the right hand, independence of the fingers, and so. Coordination, mm -hmm. synchronization, yeah. Uh, well, beautiful. I think, I think uh, we'll do one more question. Um, with all the experience you have now, the prize you have won, what would you recommend to young people that have to prepare for competitions? Okay, so... I think, uh, like I said, the number one thing is to pre prepare well. You know, the preparation is important, not just with competition, but with concert as well. So more you prepare, more your work is done, more you're polished, the better you will do. So, and that also teaches you for the future, you know, how to prepare and, and, and what to do. And, and um, but um, that would be, you know, my main, main suggestion. And play something that you are comfortable playing. Don't play something too difficult. Don't, um, you know, you can, you can still, um, uh, you know, show your skill and, and your talent even by not playing always something that's, you know, constantly very technical. And so just pick the pieces that you feel comfortable with. Um, and, uh, you know, also, it's good to play them, you know, through several times before for your friends or for your family or, you know, just play through the pieces. Mm -hmm. Play for your teacher several times so that you feel comfortable. Um, and then, you know, just uh, try to imagine that you're not playing, you know, for judges. Try to imagine that you're just playing for a concert because it's, the competitions are, I think, the most difficult uh, form of performing. You know, it's, it's very nerve-wracking. So, um yeah, but that would be, you know, number one would be just, just prepare well. I said, that's very well put. I, and uh, try not to imagine that you're playing for judges. Uh, I suppose that's easier when one actually has an audience. Sometimes you have rounds where there's only judges, you know, in the, yes. in the hall, and that's super scary. That it's is very scary, yes, because you know. you know that they're judging you, you everything that you're doing. So that's very that's scary. True. Yeah, well, uh, uh, you know, I think this is a beautiful way to sort of ask you uh, for a message to all of the up-and-coming guitarists out there, uh, you know, making their, uh, their careers uh, right now and uh, trying to figure out their artistic self. Uh, what would your message be? What would you want to say to someone who aspires to be, I don't know, the next John Williams or the next where? Um, well, I think I think the, the number one thing is that you know the love that we have for music and for the for the instrument. Um, so that's without that, um, you know, uh, it's it's very difficult to keep going because it's a, it's it's a difficult profession, as as you know, you know, as, as we all know. So. Um, you, there has to be a connection with the instrument that comes first. Um, so, and then you know, um, don't give up if there is times where you don't feel like you should, you know, continue. This, um, 
it's a it's a very long road you know it's not something's going to happen overnight so it's you have to realize that you know you, it's going to take a long time uh, but also i think number one is to you know constantly work on your on your um talent and your you know ability and, and practice and work very hard and just uh, you know to develop your potential you know in the in, in the best possible way so um and just you know stay persistent and don't give up i think especially now it's a very difficult time for musicians you know with this pandemic um i just hope that people continue i hope that people don't you know don't get discouraged because um this might you know last for a while but i, I hope that we can you know i hope we can stay positive and kind of just continue what we're doing you know so that is so beautifully said. Uh, I must uh, say uh, that you um, you said it almost verbatim as uh, Thielmann Hopstock did uh, a few weeks back. This love for the instrument, for the music, is what brought us uh, to this place in the first, uh, you know, at the beginning. It is something that was this driving force, and we couldn't resist it. And we picked up the instrument and we started playing and we've been enjoying playing ever since. And yes, it's always hard as everything in life. Um, and this current situation is no exception. It's in fact, perhaps even harder. Uh, but we must remember this love uh, that will persist and persevere. And uh, at the end of the day, we can always feel happy because we have something uh, that we do that we do out of love and not necessarily out of just necessity and this is a, a wonderful message you, you you said it very beautifully yes that's, that's, yeah. yeah thank you for uh, so, saying that I mean it's something especially now in this difficult time and if we can keep that thought uh, I think we will be okay you know it's just we have to constantly you you know remind ourselves this, that we do this for the love of the instrument. We all do this for that. Mm. Otherwise, the instrument is not going to, I mean, it's, we have to, we, we owe it to the instrument, you know, to, mm. to, to keep it, you know, keep it alive, so. I think young people do this. Yes. <laughs> love, yeah, yeah, you're right. So, yes, yes yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, with that thought, um, I would like to thank you for your time. It was uh, it was incredible to to be able to spend uh, this hour, almost an hour, uh, talking with you. Um, uh, we are all looking forward to your concert. So everyone listening, tune in. Don't forget. Uh, and um, until we meet next time in person, I wish you all the best and uh, best of health. I hope you have a wonderful time in Croatia. Uh, say hi to the Adriatic coast for me as well. I will. And, uh, I hope we stay in touch. We'll stay in touch. Thank you so much, Mark and Duna. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye.